Shall I start? Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes for others to join. Uh, we have an exceptionally high number of registrants, so it's gonna take a little bit. So we'll be back to you very soon. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for this important discussion. 
I'm Catherine Matthews with the Ottawa Health Coalition, and I'll be our moderator for this evening's discussion. This conversation is being simultaneously interpreted. This means that you can choose to listen in English or in French. At the bottom of the screen, you will see a button that allows you to change or choose your language. I'll wait a moment while you all do so. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we, the panelists, live and work is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. We give our respect to the original occupants of this land as we proceed with our work this evening. In this new virtual space that we are using, it is even more important to attend to the land that feeds, houses, and provides for all. Tonight, we have attendees from across Turtle Island, and for that matter, from places beyond, who are living, working, and occupying lands where others, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, have lived before over all time. As we come together tonight as First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, and as settlers, let us each reflect on where we live, on the land that we call home, and give our respect to the land and to its peoples across generations. Are you aware of the history of the land you live and work on? What is your understanding of the impacts of colonial violence against Indigenous communities? What does reconciliation mean to you? What does reconciliation look like to you? I ask you to take a moment to reflect and to acknowledge and to do your work and live your life with this in mind. We will be taking questions after the panel discussion. Because there are so many of you participating, and thank you for that, we'll take your questions by message. At the bottom of the screen, you will also see a button that indicates Q&A. You can type your questions here in either language, and our team will translate and pass them on to me. Feel free to send your questions throughout the panel discussion and we'll get to them after our panelists have made their remarks. The Ottawa Health Coalition is a nonpartisan community-based coalition of individuals and groups. As a local chapter of the Ontario Health Coalition, the Ottawa Health Coalition advocates for improvements to the province's universal public health care system. We have lobbied successive provincial governments to end cuts to hospital funding including men ma making budget submissions. We have held candidates debates and information sessions during federal, provincial and municipal elections. And we've been actively calling on governments to address the crisis in long-term care. There will be people in the audience who are frustrated to learn that your pension contributions are used to fund the operations of this private corporation that as we've learned during the course of the pandemic provides substandard care to seniors and unacceptable treatment of workers. This is part of a larger discussion that we need to have about removing private for-profit providers from long-term care and indeed our healthcare system overall. We were thrilled to learn that the BC Supreme Court has ruled private healthcare is not a constitutional right if wait times are too long. The Ottawa Health Coalition decided to host this virtual town hall discussion in order to strengthen efforts already underway to push the Public Sector Pension Plan Investment Board, which we will refer to as PSPIB, to divest its interest in Rivera Inc. and to take the steps necessary to ensure that Rivera long-term care facilities are moved to public ownership and operation. As you will hear this evening, the Public Service Alliance of Canada National President Chris Elward wrote, wrote to the PSPIB earlier this year to demand just such a divestment and deprivatization. Most of Elward's members contribute to the pension plan and have an interest in ensuring that their investments do not contribute to the privatization of health care. On that note, we'll start with James Infantino, our, our PSAC representative this evening. James Infantino is the National Pensions and Disability Insurance Officer for the Public Service Alliance of Canada, PSAC. PSAC represents more than 200,000 workers in every province and territory in Canada and in locations around the world. James represents the PSAC of the Canadian Capital Stewardship Network and holds a certification in Public Service Pension Plan Retirement Planning 
from Public Works and Government Services Canada. He served 15 years as a labour activist with the Canadian Union of Postal Workers before joining PSAC. Welcome James and go ahead. Thank you very much Catherine and thank you very much for everyone for joining this town hall on this most important issue. Um, what my role here is going to be the, today, this evening, is I'm going to try and provide some background information on Rivera and the PSAC and how that led us to having this town hall meeting this evening. So first of all, in talking about Rivera, Rivera is the second largest for-profit provider of long-term care facilities in Canada. They operate in six jurisdictions, Ontario, British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, Rivera is actually a wholly owned subsidiary of a federal crown corporation called the Public Sector Pension Investment Board. Um, and the Public Sector Pension Investment Board through its operational uh, organization, PSP Investments, is responsible for investing and managing the pension funds of federal public service employees and retirees, members and retirees of the RCMP, and members and retirees of the Canadian Forces. Overall, they manage about $169 billion in pension funds and have uh, uh, $169 billion in assets under management. Now, the one thing you have to understand about the Public Service Pension Investment Board and the legis presiding legislation is that the legislation prohibits any bargaining agent or any union to be involved in the management and investment of their pension funds. And this is quite unlike any other jurisdiction in Canada. Many other jurisdictions, the unions are involved in joint trusts and they have some sort of say or some sort of influence on how their pension funds are invested. That is not the case with the Public Sector Pension Investment Board. So you can understand that makes the situation very difficult for the PSAC, particularly when we're dealing with issues like Rivera. Okay, so um, even before anybody ever heard of COVID-19, uh, COVID what we had, the PSAC had many issues with Rivera prior to that. For example, in 2012, about 80 licensed practical nurses, uh, health aides, and other uh, social workers involved organized themselves and into a union and started collective bargaining with one of the facilities of Rivera in Alberta. It was called Rivera Riverbend. Now they attempted to achieve a collective agreement. Their basic demand was they wanted wages and working conditions that met industry standards. That was basically their demand. They entered in negotiations. Unfortunately, they were unable to reach a collective agreement and they started a strike, which is usually happens when the breakdown in negotiations. Well, into the 51st day of that strike, the PSAC gets a call from the union that represents these members, which happened to be the Alberta Union of Public Employees. And of course they indicated or they requested, you know, listen, PSAC, isn't there anything you can do about this situation? I mean, these are your pension funds. You're funding the employer who's run, running roughshod over us at the collective bargaining table. So can't you intervene in this matter? So what the PSAC did is the national president wrote to the CEO of PSP Investments and said, listen, we're a federal public service bargaining agent. You're managing our pension funds. We believe in fair collective bargaining and reaching fair collective agreements. Perhaps you should instruct Rivera to get back to the bargaining table and negotiate a fair agreement. So we wrote that to the CEO of uh, PSP Investments. Well, the response we got back was su uh, somewhat surprising as well as being curt and dismissive. It was somewhat surprising. And what the CEO said is, well, Rivera operates as an independent entity. They're operating as an entity of themselves. And therefore, as a crown corporation, it's not within our mandate to get involved in operational issues involving Rivera. 
So they had no intention of in, in, getting involved in collective bargaining or instructing Rivera to get back to the bargaining table. So that was the response we got. And that was quite surprising because when you think about it, if that's the case, then who is Rivera accountable to? They don't have to file financial statements to anybody, and yet they operate in this manner, and yet they're funded by our pension funds. So ultimately, that particular situation was resolved the, after a while and out of concern for the residents in the facility, the Alberta government intervened. They had legislative authority to end the strike and put the parties back to binding arbitration to reach an agreement. So that's how that resolved. And so that was one of our experiences with Rivera. Then we moved to 2018 and CTV's W5 ran an investigative report called Questionable Care. And what the program was focused on was a class action suit that was developing in the province of Ontario by members of patients or clients in Rivera facilities who had passed away and had been subject to, you know, horrendous neglect and maltreatment. It was quite, it was quite eye raising, eyebrow raising. And so that was the focus. And of course, they were going to start launching a class action suit against Rivera and as well as two other uh, for-profit uh, operators of long-term care facilities in Ontario, uh, Sienna, and uh, extended care. So PSAC got word of this. Obviously this was a concern. I mean, again, these are our pension funds at work. So again, we wrote, the national president of the PSAC wrote to the CEO of PSCP Investments and said, listen, what's happening here? Is there any validity to any of these claims? How are you gonna deal with this? And again, the response we got back from the CEO, again, curt and dismissive, was we don't get involved in the operational functions of Rivera. They operate completely independently, and we won't get involved. Not only that, we won't comment before any case that's before a court, any court proceedings. So that's our position. We're not going to you know, involve ourselves with Rivera's activities. So that was the sort of answers we were getting from the CEO and PSP Investments with respect to their role and our ability to influence uh, their role in, in the functions of Rivera. So now we come to 2020, COVID-19. The dark days of April and May. Media reports of mounting death tolls, uh, outbreaks, uh, uh, in uh, long-term care, long care facilities, uh, and as well, further news of further class action suits that are arising both in Ontario and Alberta, and that are targeted directly at Rivera. So, you know, at some time, you have to say, you reach a point where you have to say, enough is enough. So at this point, what the PSAC did is the national president wrote to the uh, CEO of PSP Investments, except this time we weren't asking, we were demanding. And what we demanded in that letter, and I'm gonna read it, so to ensure that not everybody understands what the position of the PSAC is involved in this file. The demand was that PSP Investments initiate immediate and formal comprehensive consultations with the federal and provincial governments for the transition of the management and control of Rivera Incorporated operations to the score corresponding provincial health authorities in jurisdictions where Rivera Incorporated operates. That's our demand. But not only did we write to the CEO, we made the, the correspondence public. We posted it on our national website and we issued a press release. Well, the media got a hold of that and they ran with it. They, they continually hounded some of the cabinet ministers about this situation with Rivera, in particular, John E. Duclos, who's the president of the Treasury Board, and his responsibility is the Public Sector Pension Investment Board. And he had, had the audacity at one point to indicate, well, he was powerless. 
He was powerless to do anything about PSP investments or Rivera. Imagine that, a minister of the cabinet indicating that he's powerless to do something that's within his mandate and his jurisdiction. The media, the media continued to exert pressure during these daily briefings on the COVID uh, pandemic, and eventually it reached the heights of the Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Freeland, and the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. And both Trudeau and Freeland said both in the House of Commons and outside the House of Commons with respect to Rivera and the proposal by the PSAC that, quote, everything is on the table, okay? So then Parliament recessed, and then we know Parliament prorogued after that. And so now the PSAC is here, and we're going to continue to pursue this struggle. And so we decided to hold this town hall meeting in conjunction with our allies, and we're going to have proposals later in discussion about how everybody can take action to move this agenda forward and be on the right side of history. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about that, just providing a bit of background information for the audience. Thank you, Catherine. Sorry, you have to unmute, Catherine. Sorry. Our next panelist is Amanda Weiss. Amanda Weiss is the National Healthcare Researcher for the Canadian Union of Public Employees. CUB represents 700,000 members in a variety of sectors, including 65,000 members who work in long-term care homes across Canada as care aides, licensed practical nurses, and dietary cleaning and clerical staff. Amanda's work focuses on pharmacare, protecting and expanding Medicare, studying healthcare privatization, and long-term care. Prior to working for CUPE, Amanda worked for seven years in two long-term care homes in Ontario. Welcome, Amanda, and please go ahead. Hello, and thank you to the Ottawa Health Coalition for inviting me to join this evening's panel. For decades, unions, long-term care workers, residents, families, public health care advocates, and academics have identified major problems related to the conditions of work and conditions of care in long-term care homes across Canada. One factor that contributes to poor working conditions and poor quality of care is the for-profit ownership of homes. To understand why the PSAC is calling for Rivera to be made public and why QP and other labor unions are recommending that profit be removed from the long-term care sector, we first need to understand why the for-profit ownership and operation of homes is so problematic. To begin, long-term care is delivered by public, private, nonprofit, and private for-profit homes. The marketization or private for-profit delivery of long-term care began to grow in Canada in the 1970s and became prominent in the 1990s. This growth occurred in tandem with the emergence of neoliberalism and the belief that private corporations would produce better and more efficient outcomes than public and nonprofit homes that operate without the disciplining effects of competitive markets. Marketization reduces community investments in long-term care. Care comes to be viewed as an individual responsibility rather than a collective duty. This undermines our sense that the public has a role to play in addressing the issues the system faces and in shaping long-term care policy. Most for-profit homes are part of a chain. Some chains are publicly traded companies owned by a corporation or trust, while others are privately owned by large companies and equity funds. Under the corporate model of for-profit homes, shareholders expect a return on their investments so homes must generate substantial profits in order to remain viable. Governments justify the growth of for-profit homes on the basis that market-based approaches to long-term care increase service delivery efficiencies, lower costs, and improve quality to a greater extent than public and nonprofit homes. Although for-profit homes have a strong foothold in the long-term care sector, the suggestion that the for-profit delivery of care will save money and improve outcomes 
is not supported in the research literature. In fact, the research shows that the opposite is more often the case. In this talk, I focus on three factors that negatively impact quality of care in for-profit homes. Staffing issues, the privatization of facility services, and corporate managerial strategies. First, hours of care and staffing levels are lowest in for-profit homes. The major operating cost in long-term care is staffing. To minimize staffing costs, for-profit operators have lower staffing levels, pay lower wages, provide fewer benefits, and offer less job security compared to public and nonprofit homes. For-profit homes also have a lower staff skill mix or fewer staff with formal qualifications, which is associated with lower quality of care. For-profit strategies promote precarity through the hiring of workers on a predominantly part-time or casual basis. Precarity reduces continuity of care and limits the development of care as a social relationship. In February 2020, the BC Seniors Advocate reported that wages paid to care aides in British Columbia's for-profit homes were as much as 28% below the industry standard. She also reported that for-profit homes failed to deliver 207,000 hours of funded care, while nonprofit homes over-delivered 80,000 hours of care beyond what they were funded to provide. The shortfall of 207,000 hours would be enough to fully staff a 168 bed care home at 3.36 hours of direct care per resident per day for one year. Low staffing levels result in higher workloads. When high workloads are combined with low wages, it may be harder for for-profit homes to recruit and retain experienced staff, thereby increasing staff turnover which negatively impacts the continuity and quality of care. Lower staffing levels also result in inadequate feeding assistance during meals, inadequate repositioning, poor incontinence care, increased prevalence of malnutrition and dehydration, higher rates of fractures, falls that result in hospitalization, pressure ulcers and respiratory infections, and less toileting assistance. For-profit homes are also associated with higher levels of verified complaints resulting from care-related deficiencies. These outcomes are also associated with lower staffing levels. When revenues generated by for-profit homes are allocated to shareholder profits, rather than improvements to staffing levels, working conditions, and therefore resident care, it is not surprising that quality of care suffers. A second strategy for-profit homes employ to cut costs and maximize profits is the contracting out of facility services, such as food, laundry, and housekeeping services. Contracting out is premised on the argument that food, laundry, and housekeeping are ancillary services that are more efficiently performed by private corporations because they can achieve economies of scale. The assumption that food, laundry, and cleaning are not integral aspects of care is a false assumption that negatively impacts the quality and continuity of care. Let's take food services as an example. Food is central to our daily lives. It's essential to our health, is important socially and culturally, and mealtimes add structure to our day. When food is contracted out, it's prepared off-site, trucked into homes, delivered on carts, and reheated. Residents don't get to enjoy the food's aromas, have no choice over portions, and alternatives are often unavailable. Food must be consumed in a specified and limited time so the plates can be returned to the off-site kitchen in a timely fashion. In some cases, uh, dietary staff are employed by the food service rather than the home, so they do not know the residents well. Residents and families are sometimes actively discouraged from talking with the contracted out dietary workers. Researchers even observed a sign posted in a dining room to remind residents and families of this request. When services are contracted out, contract flipping can occur. Contract flipping undermines the capacity of workers and residents to build strong personal relationships, which are critical to quality care. 
contracting out services generally results in poor working conditions, lower pay, fewer benefits, and reduced job satisfaction for workers whose jobs have been contracted out. In the absence of successorship rights, contract flipping also means workers must reunionize and begin the process of negotiating a new collective agreement when their existing collective agreement does not follow them into the new service contract. This decline in the conditions of work in long-term care has a gendered impact. Women account for 80% of workers and residents in long-term care, and women from racialized and immigrant communities make up a growing proportion of those who provide care and contracted out services. As a result, contracting out has a disproportionate impact on workers from these populations. The Saskatchewan Health Authority's annual reports on the province's long-term care facilities show that the number one complaint among residents who are surveyed is the facility's food. Residents routinely ask for better quality food, more food, and more choice in what they eat, highlighting the centrality of food to residents' quality of life. A third problem associated with for-profit homes is seen in the managerial strategies they employ that are taken from the corporate sector. Private companies manage for-profit homes and also sell their services to nonprofit and even public homes. Managerial strategies adopted from the private sector are primarily focused on tasks and cost savings rather than quality care. Pat Armstrong argues that managerial practices taken from the business sector are designed for just enough labor by just enough people with just enough education and just enough pay to make a profit rather than providing good care. For-profit managerial strategies are focused on tasks that can be measured or counted and leave little if any room for talking with residents, taking them for a walk, or letting them soak in a bath those things that are difficult to measure, but help to foster care as a social relationship and enhance quality of life. Pat has found there is compelling evidence that the non-profit management of homes tends to be better because it provides more democratic and accountable control of homes, more protections for both residents and workers, more possibilities for developing choices, as well as better care. In contrast, she notes for-profit corporations that manage homes are difficult to monitor and hold accountable, let alone control, particularly when they operate internationally. This is evidenced in the difficulty we have finding information related to company profits, who sits on a company's board, and what decisions are made behind closed doors. The pandemic has focused attention on the dire situation in long-term care related to the conditions of work and the conditions of care. Making long-term care part of our public health care system and eliminating profit-making from the sector are critical to improving conditions for current and future generations of workers and residents. Canadians and our governments must take these recommendations seriously. Thank you, Catherine, and back over to you. Thank you, Amanda. Our next panelist, Anil Naidu, is a national representative at the National Union of Public and General Employees, NAPCHI. NAPCHI represents upward of 390,000 members delivering public services of every kind to the citizens of their home provinces. Anil sits on the board of the Canadian Health Coalition and is co-chair of the Canadian Health Professional Secretariat. Over the past two decades, he has been actively involved in numerous campaigns in support of strengthening and improving public health care in Canada. Welcome, Anil. Please go ahead. Thank you, Catherine. And thanks to the Ontario Health Coalition and the Ottawa Health Coalition for putting on this forum, and as well to the Public Service Alliance of Canada for their strong and principled stand on Rivera. Uh, I think that it's uh, an important uh, position that they've taken that has put the whole sector on notice. And I do hope that this uh, discussion that we're having today is a launch point for the much needed uh, reform that is needed. I'm, as you note, I'm pleased to speak on behalf of the National Union of Public and General Employees. Uh, our union is on the front lines of healthcare, and we are hearing from our members about the terrible situation, the tragedies that are happening in long-term care. 
And for me, it is also personal, not only on a professional level, but personally, um, my father was scheduled to be going into uh, a facility, a residence uh, on May 1st. And uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen. But I do think that we all should take this very personally. This is a collective stain on our country. Um, none of us really want to be here today. I think that, uh, you know, to have to revisit and uh, this ongoing um, tragedy, and I will say it is ongoing because even as you watch the numbers now, we are at the cusp of a second wave. And we know that there are many uh, facilities across the, the country that are experiencing outbreaks. And I think that um, the carnage that has been wrought uh, is disproportionate in Canada to other countries and really points to a, an abject failure. Uh, we have, uh, as been noted, um, you know, twice the rate of the OACD in terms of uh, deaths in long-term care, where 80 to eight, as much as 80% of our deaths have been related to uh, this, uh, this sector. I think that that, uh, that is exposing not uh, an unknown concern. It's one that has been raised repeatedly, but it seems to have taken um, uh, COVID and the, the pressure that it put on the system, our healthcare in general, and many other aspects of our, uh, of our public services. Uh, and it has taken uh, the military being called out uh, to take over five of the worst facilities and even governments in two provinces have had to um, uh, implement legislation to take over management of, of some of these failed facilities. Uh, but let's be clear, I mean, there's only one way that for-profit long-term care uh, makes any sense, and that is because it's virtually unregulated. It's uh, where workers can then be exploited, uh, seniors can be provided substandard care, uh, and we all know that profit has no place in long-term care and healthcare in general. Uh, this is, uh, you know, foundational to our Canadian identity, uh, to Medicare, and to artificially put a, um, uh, a barrier between our uh, public health care system and our long-term care uh, is uh, abhorrent, frankly, uh, because what we've seen over the last number of years is that these companies uh, have been using that, uh, that loophole, that uh, lack of regulation, to increasingly expand uh, their offerings and, uh, and essentially turn themselves into uh, private uh, uh, healthcare facilities. Um, so uh, this is why Anupchi and others uh, across the labor movement are calling for long-term care to be brought under the Canada Health Act. And we're doing this with the full uh, support of Canadians, frankly. Um, we have seen uh, in polling that we did through Abacus, 86% of Canadians favor this. Now that's a huge number. Yeah, they favor long-term care facilities being brought into the, under the Health Canada Health Act. But what's as shocking and as, as um, uplifting is that only 2% of Canadians oppose this action. Uh, that's almost a rounding error. There's no poll that I've seen that, uh, you know, 2% is it's un unheard of to have that small an opposition uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, one of these key questions. So I do think that, that uh, our, uh, our politicians should take notice and are hopefully are taking notice. We also saw another Angus Reid poll where two thirds of Canadians favored nationalization of long-term care in this country. So certainly uh, it's not public opinion that's uh, holding this back, it's uh, political will. Just uh, uh, slightly further on the military report, I would encourage people to read it. It's, it's 15 pages long. And it's written in a very understated manner, but when you actually look at what they're saying, um, it does point to systemic abuse and criminal -like negligence. But I wanna be clear that uh, workers in, the, in these facilities are also victims in terms of the neglect and, and uh, negligence of the owners. Uh, it, they have been put in an impossible situation trying to care for patients without proper support uh, some the PPE has been locked away from uh, from them and has been has, has been noted in many cases. They have low staffing levels. They were given no information, and all the while as they're trying to take care of uh, of uh, their clients, uh, they're fearing for their own safety and the safety of their families. Uh, this is already a physically and an emotionally difficult job, and it was made impossible by the failures of the owners and the failures of governments to properly monitor and regulate these facilities. <clears throat> Excuse me. So while all this is bleak, well, at action, I have to tell you, it is set to get worse. Um, we do have an aging population, 
And we, some reports say that we almost have to double the number of beds that we have in long-term care in the next 15 years. And we have absolutely no plan, uh, no public plan, no public policy, no uh, uh, government will to deal with this. So what that means is that uh, we are essentially leaving this to the private for-profits to fill in the vacuum, fill in that gap. This must be avoided at all costs because Canadians have known for a long time that there have been issues with long-term care. But we now know abjectly and uh, profoundly that uh, this system is broken and that means that we have a responsibility to demand action and to take action. Uh, over the next months, there will be inquiries, commissions, lawsuits, and inquests as to what has happened. Uh, but we know what happened. Our, our seniors were neglected and abused because we allowed a system that has already failed them to, to continue to fail them in the midst of the worst public health crisis in 100 years. Uh, so what I'm calling for all of us to do is be very vigilant uh, for what I call false solutions. And this is where money is thrown at, uh, at the problem, but really in effect uh, only ends up propping up the for-profit -pro sector that should be exiting and should be um, uh, taken back into the public hands. So this is a very real danger because as we've seen in many cases, uh, these bailouts uh, and, and of course, if you read the messaging of the private uh, for-profit clinics, that's the first thing they said is that, you know, governments haven't invested enough to, to allow us to, um, to uh, upgrade our systems upgrade our facilities so that uh, they would be uh, um, stronger against COVID. Well, that absolutely bears no resemblance to the facts because millions have been taken out in terms of profit and that's what's uh, stopped the reinvestment in the system. Um, so that's not to say the government should be let, let off the hook. They must act, there are resources. I will say that, um, you know, this, the whole kind of uh, messaging that, you know, we can't afford that, you may start to hear again coming up but uh, do not believe it. There is enough money, there is enough resources to deal with these fundamental issues. What's missing is the political will. Uh, we spend a lot of money on, on things that are far less important than this. And public health, public health care, long-term care, and the dignity of our seniors is something that's well worth investing in. So I'll end by, by trying to put this in a bit of a larger context. Um, I do think that you know, we also need to look at healthcare reform in general. We do need issues like pharmacare. We do have to deal with um, the expansion of, of private uh, clinics in, in Canada, privatization in Canada. These are all things that COVID has exposed as, as clear and present dangers to our uh, public health care system. And I will say uh, that there is hope uh, and the can be ruling that if, uh, I hope many of you had a chance to, to, um, to see uh, what uh, Justice Steves in BC uh, ruled when there was a direct attack on our public health care system in this charter challenge by Dr. Day from the Canby Clinic, uh, which wanted to undermine the, the foundation of the Canada Health Act and our Provincial Health Act. And in an 880 page ruling, um, it was unequivocal and, and a strong testament to uh, everything that we've been saying for decades as public health care advocates. So uh, I, I want to point to Canby and, and also uh, use that to push to, to the Canby ruling to push our, our politicians to take action because the collective and uh, public health care in Canada is worth saving and we must act to save it because uh, as has been pointed out by this virus of profit in long-term care, uh, things can unravel very quickly when there isn't regulation and we're not supported under the Canada Health Act. So thank you for having me today. Thank you, Anil. Our final panelist is Kevin Skerritt. Kevin Skerritt is a senior research officer assigned to pensions for the Canadian Union of Public Employees. He is currently on a leave of absence to lecture at Carleton University's Institute of Political Economy as a visiting professor. Kevin has served as a co-editor of the Cornell University Press volume, The Contradictions of Pension Fund Capitalism, 2018. He is a member of the Ottawa Health Coalition. Welcome, Kevin, please go ahead. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you to the fellow panelists and everybody uh, involved in organizing, um, but also thank you to all of you out there listening and following this. 
Um, I'll just say quickly, uh, by further introduction, uh, I am a, a staff researcher for QP, uh, and I work on pensions. I get involved in discussion about pension fund investment. But for tonight's panel, um, my role is uh, speaking on behalf of the Ottawa Health Coalition, which has taken an active interest in this problem. Um, I want to quickly also say, sort of uh, to set up my comments, uh, that I want, I, I want to start by expressing uh, my own personal admiration and respect for uh, the frontline workers uh, in long-term care who have been carrying this system amidst this crisis, mostly women and disproportionately racialized, as Amanda said, but all of whom uh, at the front lines undervalued undercompensated and struggling with uh, the mismanagement that people have uh, have underlined. I, I kind of feel like our, our, our panel tonight in our town hall is in part our small way of honoring that crisis and those people, those two groups, uh, including all the family members that have been dealing with this. Uh, and, and I think the best way to honor the people who have suffered most is by working together to make sure that this broken system gets transformed out of this. Uh, and that's what our agenda is for tonight. Uh, so my comments, I'm gonna try to elaborate on, on a couple of the comments that have been made by others, but my particular take on this is around pensions, pension plans, pension funds, pension fund investment, and the tensions and contradictions involved in this, what this example tells us. Uh, and so I'm gonna pick up on a, on a few things that James and others said Maybe starting by simply saying, as far as I'm concerned, and my experience with QP and with other pension plan members, pension activists, trade union members, people who belong to pension plans, workers do not want their pension fund to be generating a rate of return out of exploitation of other workers, out of deprivation of service in vital public services like healthcare, long term care and many other kinds of uh, public services. Uh, so this reality is a problem. So to turn to it, the first point I wanna, I wanna turn to is a bit of an elaboration on some of what James said. James covered a bit of the basic structure of this strange reality that the Federal Public Service Pension Fund, uh, PSP as we, we call it, is the owner of Rivera. I just wanna elaborate on that a little bit. Rivera is in fact 100% owned by the PSP, this fund manager. It is, it is not invested in some stocks. It's not a partial owner. It owns the company outright. So in that sense, it controls it fully on a, what's called a private equity basis. Uh, and that matters uh, for reasons I'll, I'll, I'll add. Uh, but just a, one more word about the original establishment of Rivera in 2006. So PSP as a crown corporation dedicated to this investment was only established in 1999. In 2006, they established Rivera by acquiring an existing chain of long-term private for-profit long-term care facilities and they rebranded and structured it into Rivera. Why did they do that? I'll just say quickly, really it's an elaboration of what Amanda and others have already said. There was a process underway really in the 1990s, early 2000s of restructuring uh, long-term care as a service into something that could be increasingly privatized. And, and I think people know the Ontario government was at the forefront of that. They made a, several policy changes uh, that made private ownership easier. Uh, they facilitated the construction of more beds and facilities on a, a private for-profit basis. And they eliminated at the time in the 90s, an existing minimum standard of care that provided a certain minimum framework for staffing and care levels. They got rid of that. And they did that under pressure from private for-profit providers. That made the industry more profitable. And that made the PSP that was looking for new investments interested in the sector. So that's how they got into it in the first place. That then turns us to the question, uh, how profitable is Rivera? Uh, this, if this is, uh, if they get into it for the profits to, to, to pad the returns of the pension fund, well, how much profit is involved here? Well, James has already pointed this out, and, and I think it's worth underlining. Uh, we don't know. Uh, 
there is no obligation. There's no disclosure obligation because this is a private equity company. There are no obligations to tell anyone, not the general public, not parliament, and certainly not the members of the pension plan on whose behalf this investment is supposedly taking place. So in fact, no one knows. Uh, I think we can guess and speculate because the other bar large chains are very profitable, but we actually don't know. And I think that's a, a problem in, in its own right. Uh, we need a system that's going to be more accountable uh, to pension plan members and also to Canadians, especially insofar as PSP is actually a federal crown corporation, ultimately overseen by the federal cabinet. I want to tack onto this, though, just one quick point, uh, and then I'll get back to Rivera. The Rivera problem in this particular structure of, of private for-profit ownership of infrastructure and public services is actually a larger problem than just long-term care uh, and Rivera. Uh, and if I could uh, ask Sam to, to bring up the slide, I've been doing research on how Canadian pension funds have been investing in the last 20 years. And the, the quick story is it's very disturbing what has happened uh, in the Canadian pension fund industry. Uh, PSP and six or seven other very large Canadian pension funds uh, have been moving very aggressively into areas of public infrastructure, public services that certainly uh, uh, I think many Canadians consider to be extremely controversial and, and prefer to see their public services and public infrastructure owned and operated publicly in a democratically accountable way. So when I'm talking about public services infrastructure, I'm talking about hospitals, schools, universities, highways, energy, airports, the, the, the broad range of what we consider to be infrastructure, much of which was traditionally for many decades publicly owned and operated. So just to illustrate the point, I'm sharing this slide which shows a list of the uh, uh, corporate logos of a group of uh, investment managers, asset managers, and pension funds that belong to something called the Global Infrastructure Investors Association. And in a nutshell, this is an international association of large asset owners that lobby governments for more privatization, for transforming more public infrastructure into privately ownable infrastructure on a for-profit basis. And I just show you the slide. The, the reason I found this powerful is there's PSP, I've circled it with an arrow, uh, sitting in this club, this organization alongside Goldman Sachs and uh, Morgan Stanley, these enormous Wall Street investment banks, uh, Blackstone, an enormous giant of private equity. These are the companies and organizations based in Wall Street and London that are looking around the world for opportunities to invest in public infrastructure, to privatize it and uh, extract profit from it. So I wanted to share that just to illustrate this Rivera problem is part of a powerful movement of the last 20 years that Canadian pension funds have been at the forefront. I'll just note that Ontario Teachers, OMERS, Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, uh, uh, Caisse de Depot, other Canadian pension funds are also in this club belonging to this lobby organization looking for more. But let me turn back now, to, and I, we can drop the slide. Let me turn back to just a, a reiteration of a couple of the simple points that have been made. Quite simply, the pandemic has clarified, I think, for all of us, there are certain vital public services that simply should not be provided on a for-profit basis. We need certain things to be provided by organizations whose primary mandate is the public interest and the delivery of public services. And I want to argue uh, that this is, uh, this is the case even when, or perhaps especially when, uh, it is pension funds that are involved. Pension funds should be the, uh, that are investing the money of workers should be the last organizations looking to invest in this way. Again, to repeat the point, most workers do not want their pension fund to be bad actors, to be actually creating a, a, a harsher world for workers and for communities. And that applies to Canada, that also applies to what they do in other countries. Okay, so just to cut to the chase and to, and to move to wrapping this up, um, I wanna say a few words about what do we do about this? What, what do we do about Rivera and the PSP and, and, and even what do we do about the larger problem? I just want to uh, re reiterate what has been said 
I think the call from the PSAC in May of this year to challenge this practice and to transfer the ownership and control of Rivera specifically from this private for-profit operation under PSP control into public hands, this is a very important uh, call that I think provides us with an opportunity to, uh, to, to really force the issue and to really put the question of privatized for-profit long-term care onto the agenda. Uh, and, and I say this particularly because it is currently owned and controlled under this federal crown corporation, which is ultimately accountable to the federal government and to cabinet. This is something that we actually have an immediate and direct path to doing something about. We have to act politically and get organized. So uh, I'll just wrap by saying, fortunately, the Ottawa Health Coalition, in partnership with the Ontario Health Coalition, is now committed to moving forward with uh, uh, campaign work, strategic action, calling for making Rivera public, making all of for-profit long-term care uh, public. And I'll mention in closing, and maybe we can follow this up, that there are already actions that are available to be taken. Uh, there's an online letter campaign that people can sign. Uh, and I just learned recently this week that the Ontario Health Coalition is about to announce a province-wide, this is only Ontario, but a province-wide day of action in defense of long-term care, which calls for reestablishing minimum care standards, recruiting and properly paying and compensating workers, frontline workers. And it also calls to make Rivera public and in fact, make all of the for-profit operators public. This is a, a, a bold recent announcement. I urge people to get to follow this, to join up. Uh, if you're in Ontario, there will be actions available. And if you're outside of Ontario, I encourage you to, to connect with what's happening and consider taking up action, whether it's direct political action around Rivera or whether it might be taking action around what your own pension plan and pension fund is doing, especially if you're in the federal public service uh, or your pension plan is managed by PSP. So that's, uh, I do think there's, uh, there is work to be done, uh, but there is a path forward for making the transformation of this system that I think we all agree is really needed. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for the time and for listening. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you to all the panelists. Uh, we are going to move into the question and answer portion of our evening. And uh, I remind you to type your questions in English or French into the Q&A at the uh, button at the bottom of your screen. But before we do that, before we go to the questions, we have Christine Collins joining us. Um, Christine is a member of the Ottawa Health Coalition, um, but she would like to share with us for a few minutes uh, her personal story. Um, she had a very difficult experience with a Rivera long-term care home in Ottawa. So Christine, welcome, and please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I struggled for more than two years to help my brother and get him into long-term care so that he would be safe. As an alcoholic, prescription drugs, mobility disability, not eating with any regularity and a hoarder, I really believed, believed he needed help and he needed to go into long-term care. He was transferred from the hospital to Carling View Manor, a for-profit long-term care facility owned by Rivera on April 1st this year. And that was because they needed the bed at the hospital. He was in what was supposed to be isolation, not, on the secure floor for dementia residents who wander in and out of rooms which was a free-for-all with no monitoring. Less than four weeks later, on April 25th, he tested positive for COVID and he had breathing problems, chest pain, severe headaches, and my worst nightmare came true. I got absolutely no information, no communication, calls were not returned, and worse, the stress, the worry, and the overwhelming guilt with him being very sick and not safe at all. My only regular contact was with him 
by cell phone. I keep a daily journal and here's a few things from it. On May 23rd, I was advised he was now COVID free. Between April 15th and May 19th, 35 of my calls were not answered. Nine calls, I left messages with zero callbacks. Seven calls were initiated by one nurse when she was on, and I can't thank you enough, Linda. I'm so glad you came back and really appreciated everything you did. I had got one call from the doctor on May 7th and no updates otherwise. When I did get to talk to someone prior to his getting COVID, I was always told, don't worry, there's nothing to worry about. When I talked about all the residents wandering in and out of his room, I was told it was his responsibility to tell them to leave. They were very short staffed and they had no one to monitor. I completely blame Carling View Manor for him testing positive. and the continued post-COVID symptoms that he still has. I know they're very short-staffed, they're still short-staffed. The few times I got to speak to someone, staff shortages were always mentioned. Post-COVID still today, he suffers severe migraines, still shortness of breath and other symptoms. There was a brief period of improved communication um, Post-COVID, when Heidi, a nurse practitioner, checked in on him for a few weeks, and he was calling me every week, but he left after five weeks, so back to zero. Communi back to zero communication. They gave him more phone, and he's still on it today for the uh, migraine headaches and more recently antidepressants that are also supposed to help with the headaches. We were to discuss the effectiveness of the antidepressants after one week, but despite my trying for over a month, no discussion has taken place. The one positive is visiting weekly outside. I do not feel safe going inside that facility or even entering. When I check in outside, I see people going in and out. No one wipes down the door handles. Um, and I know that there are multiple people using um, the elevators. The visiting inside are in the patient's rooms, or the resident's rooms. And on his floor, there is no social distancing um, due to um, people with advanced dementia. The sadness of all of this and my guilt remain and get stronger. To summarize, although staff did their best during this time, very short staffed, it is very clear to me that things went, were very bad. Lack of care for residents, at least on the dementia floor. Shower room was closed during the lockdown. So no way to even keep yourself clean. I was told because of the staff shortage, there was no one to sanitize the shower room between users. There was little to no communication and Carling View Manor had the highest number of COVID cases and deaths. They had the absolute highest in Ottawa. The three most affected facilities are all the for-profits. My notes of May 8th show 138 residents that's 43% and 73 staff members contacted COVID. And sadly, on that date, up to 42 residents had died. These numbers have increased since, and the number of deaths has raised to 61 deaths. I'm not sure, but maybe you can imagine how very angry and horrified I am to find out that my pension that I paid into for 37 years owns Carling View Manor as part of the Rivera chain. It's well, well past the time to end privatization and make Rivera public. I'm asking everyone here to help. There's all kinds of actions coming, letter writing. Please support, please support us and participate in these actions. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you, Christine.
Thank you for sharing your story. I think I can say that we are all moved by the experience of you and your family and your brother. And I know for myself, it has been one of the things that's helped motivate myself and the Ottawa Health Coalition to be moving forward in this issue. We hope that, that some actions will make this an experience that no one else will go through. Thank you again. Now we're going to move to our questions. And I have a first question that I'm going to direct to Amanda. So Amanda, several listeners have asked how campaign to get the pension plan to relinquish its ownership of Rivera will actually improve the quality of long-term care. So QP, uh, so the PSCC is actively uh, uh, lobbying for the PSP to divest itself uh, of Rivera. Um, for QP, uh, our, we are currently running a, a national campaign and one of our key demands uh, is the elimination of uh, private for-profit operators uh, and homeowners uh, from, from the sector. So currently our, our campaign consists of writing a letter uh, to the federal government uh, calling on them uh, to invest more public funding uh, in long-term care and to and take uh, the, to support the position that we need to eliminate uh, the profit element from the sector and to make long-term care part of our public universal health care system. I, I just I just want to follow I just want to follow up Amanda because I think um, the, the question uh, was related to um, how bringing it into public ownership will improve long-term care and um, I wonder if you could just comment a little bit more on that. How do you feel it will improve if it's a publicly owned and operated? So the focus of my, my talk that I delivered uh, outlined all the perils and pitfalls uh, of for-profit ownership, uh, namely focusing on the fact that the conditions of work and the quality of care are uh, far worse uh, in for-profit homes uh, than they are in publicly run homes. So in homes that are publicly run, uh, with respect to workers, uh, we have higher staffing levels. So workers have uh, lower workloads, which means they uh, incur lower levels of workplace injuries and are less likely uh, to encounter workplace stress and burnout. They're also paid higher wages, meaning they're less likely to have to work uh, multiple jobs at multiple homes, uh, which, as we saw throughout COVID, increased the risk for transmission of the virus uh, between homes. And also, the quality of care is much higher in for-profit homes uh, because staffing levels are higher. So workers have more time to provide care. They don't have to rush uh, from resident to resident uh, and potentially miss uh, certain aspects of care. Uh, and they can spend more time developing uh, social relationships with the residents, which, as we know, are also critical uh, to improving quality of care. Thank you, Amanda. My second question uh, I'd like to direct to, to James. One of the listeners has suggested that the pension plan's ownership, if a very risky investment given, is it a very risky investment given the lawsuits against Rivera? Are there not rules against a pension plan putting pension contributions at risk? Very, very good question. Um, and there is legal precedence that, um, uh, Plan, plan fund managers are supposed to be investing in the best interests of the plan members without undue risk. And so you're right, this, this nature of these lawsuits and the whole reputation tarnished by this, by this development with COVID is putting the, our plan members' funds at risk. And you're right, there could easily be, I would think, a law, a, a law action or legal action against PSP investments for unduly breaching what they call the fiduciary responsibility. That's their fiduciary responsibility to manage the investments in the best interest of the plan members without undue risk. We would say, just based on the surface, that they violated that. But again, 
I'm not even sure uh, we could do that, but how would that get to the issue? Just like the previous uh, questioner asked, how would that improve the 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 uh, situation of uh, 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 of residents in long-term care facilities, for-profit long-term care facilities? I don't think that would help. So we're just suggesting again, you know, that to have these issues transferred into the public sector, to have these organizations transferred into the public sector. So. No, the, the member's right. The, there could be a legal action on that. Uh, again, I'm not sure to what end that would assist with improving the lot of residents in for-profit uh, long-term long-term care facilities. Thank you for that question. Thanks, James. I have a third question that probably both James and and Kevin would be able to answer, and it is: one of the participants has asked, "What kind of levers?" are at the disposal of the federal government to bring the pension plan to put Rivera into public hands. James, do you want to start? Okay, uh, I will just say, uh, uh, I think the public service, uh, public sector pension investment board, as we've said, is a federal crown corporation structured by legislation and regulation and in that sense, it is in the hands of the federal government. Uh, if a federal government were to decide that this is a problem and that a change is necessary, it would be a very straightforward change to intervene. They would have to intervene, and it may. And you know, I haven't got uh, uh, I, I haven't got specific mechanics, but I believe it would probably require some kind of legislative change or regulatory change to intervene to make this happen. Uh, I would argue that the pandemic and the tragedy that we've just been through is the best argument for why this is now necessary and urgently required. If the federal government refuses to do this, I think we will, we will see what the real substance of the prime minister and the, the finance minister's commitment is to putting everything on the table and considering how to address this serious problem. This particular tool is directly in their hands. They could choose to move forward a positive agenda here, bring this into public hands, bring up standards of pay and care. They could do it in, in the space of months, I believe. And just to follow up on that, for Jean-Yves Duclos, who's the president of the Treasury Board, to stand out and say he's powerless to do anything about that is nonsense, and he looked ridiculous saying that. So uh, that's what we have to say about that. They certainly have the legal authority to intervene on this matter and put forward the proposal that the PSAC is uh, tabled. Thank you. I, I have um, question four. Um, I'd like to um, address it first to Anil and, and possibly to Amanda. Can't quality of care be guaranteed through regulations, such as regulations on staffing levels? Are mm. regulations not more important than who owns or runs the long-term care facility? And isn't the main problem the failure of governments to enforce care standards? Uh, why don't we start with you, Anil? Sure. I mean, it's a good question, and it's um, you know, it's the great hope that uh, uh, that uh, we can regulate uh, these bad actors. But l let's just look at what happened in Ontario when the Ford government came in, who was now you know uh, very much a, a great champion of of uh, pushing back against uh, these private uh, for-profit um, uh, homes. Um, they went down to only nine unscheduled. Um, uh, inspections of the over 600 homes in in the province okay so the drop was drastic and it it really uh, points to uh, kind of the the underlying ideology behind many governments and that is to you know the whole free market get out of the way of business uh, and yes you could you could uh, regulate uh, to the point where it would really be then be not profitable for these companies. So if you actually had the regulations that you needed in terms of ratios, in terms of the quality of food, in terms of no cockroaches, and uh, uh, then it would not be a profitable system and we would not have uh, these private for-profit uh, actors in, in the business, I truly believe. 
So it, it, it kind of gets to your point, but there is no will amongst many of these uh, of our governments, un unfortunately. They're constantly being lobbied. They're constantly being pushed the, in the other direction. And, and uh, you know, it, it's, we're at a disadvantage in, in terms of being public health care advocates, and especially when the, the clients, the seniors, uh, many of them are voiceless, uh, okay? They they're, have dementia, they have communication problems. It, it is a serious problem. We need uh, the, a publicly delivered um, uh, long-term care system. Regulation is not going to be enough, I don't believe. Thank you. Amanda. Yeah, I would just like to sort of start off um, by clarifying that there is sort of a difference between regulations on the one hand uh, and standards uh, on the other. Uh, Long-term care is a highly, highly uh, regulated sector uh, within, healthcare, uh, within the healthcare sector. Uh, and some academics even argue that uh, long-term care uh, is is even almost overregulated to the extent that we're now, uh, you know, metaphorically trying to wrap residents uh, in bubbles uh, to eliminate all possible uh, risks, uh, which also has a negative impact on quality of life because we don't, uh, you know, places limits on how freely residents can live their lives uh, within a long-term care home. Standards, on the other hand, uh, such as was mentioned in the question uh, with respect to staffing standards. So the research shows that the minimum level of care that we need is uh, 4.1 to 4.9 hours of directly worked hands-on care per resident per day in order to not just maintain a resident's health status, but to also optimize uh, their health status uh, and improve their quality of life. In Canada, currently no province or territory uh, is meeting this standard. Some provinces have guidelines, so it's an as aspirational goal uh, that homes can try to, to reach. Uh, other provinces and territories have no legislated minimum hours of care. And for those provinces that do, uh, the, 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 none of them reach the 4.1 to 4.9 uh, uh, minimum that is, is, is recommended. If there was one and only one thing that we could do uh, to improve the current state of long-term care in Canada, uh, the major focus should be on staffing. So both uh, improving staffing levels by implementing a national standard of care uh, that, that uh, standardizes the number of hours of directly worked hands-on care a resident should receive uh, per day and also uh, staff working conditions. We absolutely need to improve the working conditions for staff, including increasing their wages, providing them with paid benefits uh, and other protective measures. If we don't, we will never address the problem of recruitment and retention that is uh, occurring across Canada, and we will never be able to uh, meet the staffing standards that we want to see implemented in homes because we simply won't have uh, the staff to fill all the positions that are needed. Thanks, Amanda. Um, we're starting to get a little tight on time. I'm going to try to get two more questions in. Um, so um, let's try this one to Anil. How can long-term care be made more accessible and inclusive, especially culturally inclusive? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a tough one because uh, we know that a lot of the, the private homes began with, um, you know, uh, back in the day when uh, ethnic uh, groups, uh, cultural groups wanted to uh, keep their seniors um, housed together. So I, I think that, um, you know, Canada is, is a country that is multicultural. We all live and, uh, you know, uh, work amongst each other. So I do think that, um, you know, it is an issue in, in terms of looking at uh, how people um, uh, have their needs met on, on many different levels. But I can tell you that uh, the basic um, and substandard care that they're getting right now in, in many of the private clinics and uh, care, sorry, facilities and uh, is not in any way uh, aspirational to what we want for our seniors. So I do think that we have a long way to go um, in terms of um, looking at the whole senior. Uh, and this is another you know, uh, broader question than we're dealing with right now, but we can't even get there 
when seniors are losing their lives and, and uh, being faced by, uh, you know, the, the substandard care that they're getting right now. So I think that it, it, it's steps. And I think that overall, we have failed seniors in this country. Um, and it's not just about long term. It's not just about uh, long term care. It's not just about uh, for profit uh, homes. I mean, we have a lot of work to do that goes far beyond that. But certainly, it would be a massive first step if we got these bad actors out of the out of the system. Thank you. Thanks, Anil. Um, James, I want um, to present these this double barrel question to you, and I think that'll be our last question because I want to make sure we have time for what actions people can take. Sure. So here it is. Um, are the other unions that represent federal workers and members of the pension plan supporting PSAC's call for divesting its ownership of Rivera? And also, uh, a participant has asked if unions are represented on the pension board. Okay, the answer to the second question that I've already said is no. The legislation uh, specifically prohibits uh, bargaining agents and plan member from sitting on the board of directors of the Public Sector Pension Investment Board. Uh, with respect to the first question, we have certainly put a call out to the other bargaining agents in the Federal Public Service to assist with this uh, initiative. But like I said, I said at the beginning, you know, at some times you have to act. Enough is enough. We weren't, we weren't going to wait. We weren't going to wait to try and build a consensus around this issue. The PSAC was going to move forward with it. We'll be consulting with the other bargaining agents about this issue. But what I'll tell you is once, we, once we've started this campaign, we have not heard one complaint or one negative comment about this issue. So uh, we're confident that we can get the support of the other bargaining agents and move forward with this. Thanks, James. I think I'm going to have to stop questions there because we're running out of time and I want to make sure that we can inform everybody about what they can do because that's the most important question, of course, is what we can do to change this. How do we convince the PSPIB to divest its holdings in Rivera and to do the work to make it publicly owned and operated? The first step is to take action. As a Crown Corporation, the PSPIB is influenced by Treasury Board and Cabinet, as has been mentioned by both James and Kevin. Treasury Board President Jean-Yves Duclos, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christian Freeland, and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau have all been part of this discussion over the past months. Both the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister have indicated that everything is on the table when taking care of our seniors and when talking about long-term care models in this country. So let's show them that the only responsible decision is to make Revere public. You can do this by signing our action letter on the slide on your screen, which I think is coming up, and in the chat box to your right, you will see the website for the Canadian Health Coalition where our letter to the ministers can be found. Please take a few minutes right now and send off a letter. Take it one step further and follow the prompts to share this information with your social media followers. There's also, and thank you for that, and I think of Christine's call for action here, um, just to keep that in mind. There's also a day of action, as Kevin mentioned, on long-term care being organized by the Ontario Health Coalition for Thursday, October the 8th. In Toronto, the action will take place at Queen's Park, but in other locations across the province, people will gather outside Conservative MPP's office. Much of this information is not out yet, um, so you're getting a heads up here. Um, the key demands of the day of action um, as, as um, mentioned by Kevin, and I want to reiterate them, is for, the, is for the Ontario government to immediately move to recruit more staff, improve pay and working conditions, conditions in long-term care, and to implement a minimum care standard of four hours per day, and for the federal and provincial governments to end for-profit long-term care, starting with making Rivera public. For those of you who are outside Ontario, your organization may wish to join this action in your area and please keep in touch with what's going on through visiting and liking the Ontario Health Coalition's uh, Facebook page 
or going to their um, website. It's um, a really well-resourced website with all kinds of information on it and the information about um, the action will be there. Um, also, you may want to like our uh, page, the Ottawa Health Coalition, because we will be developing some plans for here in Ottawa for October the 8th as well. So I just um, wanted to add a couple of points myself, um, just to wrap up before, um, before thanking the panelists. I, I am struck by how um, overwhelming the opposition is in, in these investment companies and in the long-term care homes, and how we have to really get our act together to deal with the ideological position of the Ontario government. The um, Long-Term Care Association has been ramping up. They've been hiring uh, lobbyists. Uh, many of those lobbyists are connected with the government, have worked directly for people like Premier Ford. So we really have to take this seriously and move forward. So I really urge you to take action with this letter and also to follow the Ottawa Health Coalition and the Ontario Health Coalition in terms of plans here in Ottawa. So I want to thank our panelists, James, Amanda, Anil, and Kevin. I would also like to thank Christine for sharing her family's troubling experience with care at Rivera. I'd like to thank our interpreters for their important work this evening. And I'd like to thank you for taking the time to participate for the letter writing action that you're about to take and for your ongoing support. I also want to put in a pitch for the Ottawa Health Coalition. We are a volunteer organization that is always looking for help. Um, it's a really good group of people that are grounded and committed to making uh, in improvements in public health care. So you would be amongst some very good people who are really committed to this cause. So uh, we would welcome you. Um, the best thing to do is visit our Facebook page. Um, so that's it for tonight. Good night, everyone, and thank you so much for being here.